Right. Uh, we're going to continue our uh, study on the Lord's Prayer. What we're doing, we're going really almost phrase by phrase of, of the um, prayer that Jesus used to teach his disciples how to pray and, and ultimately to teach us how to pray. And as we're expanding on this, I think this will give us a lot of insights when we go to the Lord in prayer. Now, just as a review, the Lord's Prayer is not necessarily a, uh, a bunch of words that we are to repeat until we get what we want. Uh, the, the purpose that Jesus gave in, in what we call the Lord's Prayer was to give us a pattern of prayer. And we've already uh, talked about uh, the part where it says, Our Father, and we looked at God being our Father and what that, what that means. Um, and, and we even broke it down by saying, Our and Father, and, and just how powerful that is. Uh, last week, we talked about our Father who art in heaven. I mean, we, we talked about having a heavenly mindset, both as we live and as we pray. Uh, tonight... We're going to continue now with uh, the King James Version. It says, Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Uh, expressing that Jesus' name is holy. That God's name is holy. So we're going to talk about the powerful name of, uh, of God. Uh, how, how many of you are thankful for the name of Jesus? Amen. So in the first paragraph in the notes, and again, we've provided the notes for you online so you could follow along right with us. Uh, to say, how would be your name does not mean that we are praying for God's to be named to be made holy. God's name is holy. Maybe even want to underline that. God's name is holy. That's why I, I believe we dare not be flippant with the name of Jesus, that we dare not be flippant with the name of God. I think we need to be careful with that in, in how we talk. Uh, we're praying for God's holy and refining presence to work in us to honor him. And we're going to talk about an encounter that Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah had uh, when he was face-to-face -face confronted with this holy God that we're talking about today. Look at number one. What does a name represent? Uh, in business, we think in terms of a brand. The name defines the product, the service, and the identity. Um, I've learned this while my uh, son has been in the clothing uh, world in the last year or so. Uh, sometimes he'll flip shoes, which means he'll buy a pair of shoes for a ridiculous amount of money, and then he will sell them for an even more ridiculous amount of money. It's just amazing how that works. And what's interesting is that uh, certain brand names, as you might guess, are going to um, show the worth of that particular shoe. Um, certain brand names of cars are going to scream uh, worth and expense more than others, okay? If I say Mercedes, you're thinking, nice luxury car. If I say Yugo, okay? <laughs> Some of you don't even know what a Yugo is, uh, and, and it's good that you don't. Um, that's uh, something totally different. So name defines the product and the brand the, and the identity, the character and the qualities that make us essentially who we are. Uh, our identity. Um, letter A, God's name expresses and reflects his divine nature. He is who he is. When you think of God's name and when you think of God's nature, and let's ask you, uh, what, what comes to mind? When you think of God's name, uh, what comes to mind right away in your mind? Jehovah, good. What are some others? Yahweh, what was that? Holiness. holiness, good, good. Holiness, Yahweh, Jehovah. Uh, at the very end of our lesson today, we're going to look at a number of different names of God uh, that are used to describe who God is. It's pretty, it's pretty neat uh, when you do a, a study on that. Um, why do you think that Jesus taught us 
to begin our prayers by hallowing God's name or expressing that God's name is holy. Why, why do you think that Jesus said, okay, this is how you pray, okay? Right from the beginning, we're going to focus on God the Father, and we're going to make sure that people know that his name is holy. Why, why do you think Jesus started with that? To prepare our hearts. Okay, good, good. John? Uh, reverence. What's that? Reverence. Reverence, nice. I thought you said rivers. I thought, wow. <laughs> There's something deep there. Okay. Someone else had their hand up. Paula. Um, to me, there, people then were worshiping other gods and mm. that he was the God, mm. the holy God. Good, good. Our 21st century American understanding may not even grasp that, but I understand that there was very much a if I could use the fancy word, a polytheistic type of mentality there. Uh, multiple gods. People worshipped different gods. In fact, Rome even uh, said that they should uh, worship the emperor. And so here is Jesus, and he is expressing that God's name is absolutely holy. Now, we mentioned Isaiah. Uh, <laughs> let's take a look at this incredible encounter that Isaiah had. In Isaiah chapter 6, if you've been around the church for a long period of time, you've probably bumped into this passage of Scripture numerous times. And this is often called the, the moment that Isaiah accepted God's call uh, for himself. Uh, but there seems to be a lot more to it. There seems to be a lot more. I hear voices and they sound like me. I don't hear anything. Yeah, of course not. I've lost, I've lost control. It, it just, I've totally lost control. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. Uh, <laughs> let's just look at the scripture. That's always a good way to bail you out. Um, here's Isaiah. He said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I want you, by the way, to focus on that phrase, because we're going to come back to that. On the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they, uh, they were flying. <laughs> By the way, this is not really the precious moments figurine angels here, okay? This is a totally different look at, at a certain kind of angel. Let's go to verse 3. And they were calling to one another, holy, 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 is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I'm ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. And then one of the seraphim, and with it he touched my mouth, and he said, this, see, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. Here I am, send me. Now, look at number two on the first page. Like a song, we welcome God's Spirit to come and fill the atmosphere and, and let us experience the glory of His goodness. Uh, when it comes from a true heart, it's music to God's ears. It's the prayer that he will answer. And consider how the Lord did this for Isaiah. Uh, letter A, what did Isaiah see and hear and feel? Uh, and is this different from what we usually have in mind when we picture coming into God's presence? Um, and, and I chuckle because I've heard people you know, tell me, ah, when I get to heaven, me and God, we're going to have a talk. I'm telling you right now, you come into this, you ain't going to have a little talk. And, and, and we get this, you know, I don't hear it as much anymore, but, you know, the big guy upstairs, you know, that, that, that's, oh, come on. Your, your depth of knowledge of God is just so awful. You, you just need an encounter with him. And, uh, Isaiah is taken to this vision of the throne room of God, and, and, and he sees these creatures, the, the, these 
angels. And, and like I said, it's not your precious moments chubby uh, figurine going on here. And, and, and he's seeing the, 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 the temple and the doorposts are shaking. And, and it, it's just this incredible awe that he has in the presence of God. My, my, my prayer is that God, please, let us, let's catch some of that. Let's catch some of that. I don't know if any of you have ever been at a moment where the presence of God was just so real that you were overwhelmed by it. I'm not talking about getting the goosebumps when we sing some, a certain song, but I, I'm, I'm talking where you, you, can, you can like feel the presence of God. I've had those moments. It, it's, it's, it's incredible. It's life-changing. It's not, it's not normal. It's not just a bunch of fluffy songs or prom songs to Jesus. It, 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 it's, it's these, uh, that's going to make somebody mad, but, but it, it's, it's this incredible sense and awe of, of the incredible glory of God. When we sing songs, Lord, show me your glory, I know what we're saying, but I don't know if we know what we're saying. <laughs> Lord, show us your glory. And then you see this. It's like, whoa. Uh, this is not what I think Isaiah was expecting to be taken to the presence of God. Uh, letter B, what did Isaiah realize and confess about himself? Let's, let's go back. Oh, this, this, is, this is big. This is big. At the sound of their voices, the doorpost and the threshold shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Okay, look at, look at Isaiah's response in verse 5. Woe to me! I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. What what did Isaiah, and, and let her be, what did he confess about himself? What did he say? What did he say? Sinner. He was unclean. He was a sinner. It, it, this is it. When we, truly, when we truly come in contact with the presence of God, our uncleanness, our impurities, our sin will be exposed. In his, in his bright light, in his powerful presence. Um, and and that, <laughs> that was Isaiah's response when he was confronted with the Lord Almighty. I am ruined. I'm an unclean man. I live amongst unclean people, and I have seen the Lord Almighty. Let her see. One, in, in one version, it says, I'm undone. It's a response that God will always hear and, and, it will, and, and he will accept. Saying it's no big deal is never acceptable. Um, Isaiah's vision changed his understanding of God's holy response to sin, and it could change ours as well. I have a concern that uh, our young generations maybe do not understand how amazing the presence of God really is. And, and what develops, if we're not careful, can be a very flippant attitude towards the presence of God. And if we're not careful, we will create uh, generations of people who would rather be entertained than worship, who, who, who would rather... They're more... in. They're more in love with the presence of God than they are God. Does that make sense? They're more in love with how he feels more than who he is. And I think that's a danger. Because sometimes, well, I've seen it. I've seen people who have bounced from church to church to church to church trying to get their spiritual high trying to get their spiritual fix, trying to, ooh, let's go to the river. There's your river, John. You know, let, let's, you know, oh, we want to go in deeper water. And the problem is you keep on going and going and going. You're, you're, 
you're just not going to find enough that's going to scratch that itch because you're Jesus said that signs and wonders would follow the believers. And the problem is, if we're not careful, we're going to raise generations of people who, instead of signs and wonders following the believers, the believers will follow the signs and the wonders. So let's go to Isaiah chapter 8, verse 13. The Lord Almighty is the one that you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one that you are to to dread. Remember, this is Isaiah saying all this. This is after he's had his encounter with God. Uh, that he recognizes him as the Lord Almighty, as the great God, the one who uh, is like no other. In chapter 59, verses 1 and 2, it says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your uh, iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. In these verses, Isaiah hearkens back to how sin will separate us from God. Even hindering our prayers. That's what sin will do. Sin creates a separation between us and God. As a result of this encounter with God in Isaiah chapter 6, he was fully aware of the impact that a person's uh, uncleanness, a person's sinfulness can have in the presence of God. And then in chapter 57, verses 15 and 16, he says this, For this is what the high and exalted one says, He who lives forever, whose name is holy, I live in a high and holy place, but also with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit. To revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. I will not accuse them forever, nor I, will, nor I always be angry. For then they would fade away because of me, the very people that I have created. Isaiah learned that uh, true humility is how you approach the presence of God. Broken, contrite. Uh, what's the Bible say? The Lord desires a broken and a contrite heart from us. Uh, again, let's, let's remind ourselves that there is no room, no room for arrogance, uh, religious arrogance uh, in the in the kingdom of God and the presence of God. And again, this is what I have witnessed over the years. And thankful, thankfully, we don't see that here at this church. And I'm very thankful for that. But I, I, I've seen at times where if you're not careful, there can be a very religious uh, hierarchy that develops in a church. And if you're not in the club, you know, if you're not amongst the uh, <laughs> You just call them the Sanhedrin. But, but if, if you're not amongst those people who seem to have a lock on the presence of God and on the things of God, then you're just not spiritual enough. And if you don't think, do things our way, then, well, obviously, we're the ones that are closer to God. You really need to learn from us. And, and what that is, is arrogance. There is no humility in that, and God will never bless that. And we, as fleshly human beings, we can get caught up in that if we're not careful. Because uh, that is a very, very real danger. And so, broken and a contrite heart. Now, look at number three at the bottom of page one. When God wants to use a man or a woman, he lets them feel deeply their need for him. And then, he'll light a fire in them. God chose Isaiah to call his generation back to holiness. But first, Isaiah needed a personal experience of God's mercy and forgiveness that would give him purpose and stir him to say, here am I, send me. If, 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 if you think that your testimony somehow disqualifies you from being used up by the Lord to tell others about the mercy and the grace of Jesus Christ, you are so wrong because God never wastes any experience whatsoever. And so he will use your life, either what he has saved you from or what he kept you from. 
He will use your testimony for you to reflect time and time again on his grace in your life. And it's that grace that we, uh, I'll, I'll put it to you this way, we can extend and communicate grace when we ourselves realize that we have experienced grace. Does that make sense? We can extend mercy when we know that we've received mercy. We can communicate mercy when we know that we are the recipients, ultimately, of mercy from God. Now, in letter A, uh, remember that part of, the, of verse 1 that I said, keep that in mind? Isaiah starts off and he says, in the year that King Uzziah died, uh, I saw the Lord. And then he goes into this, uh, this moment where he sees God face to face. He sees the throne room of God. At this time, Judah is in a very, very dark, and in page two we're on now, he's in a very, they are in a very dark place. And God is getting ready to call Isaiah to communicate to the people that they need to turn back to God. Here's what I find interesting. I want to direct you. This is not on your notes. I kind of added this here. But it goes with that first phrase. In the year that King Uzziah died. Now that might not seem significant to you, but these verses actually might bring a lot to light as far as why Isaiah led off with that. Look at this. Second Chronicles chapter 26 and we're going to start in verse 16 and going to go to verse 22. It says, But after Uzziah became powerful, his pride led to his downfall. He was unfaithful to the Lord his God and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on, uh, on the altar of incense. Azariah the priest, with 80 other courageous priests of the Lord, followed him in. Now, what's wrong with verse 16? What's wrong with verse 16? The king is coming in to offer incense at the, temp, at, at the altar of incense. What's wrong with that? Stan? It's not, his job. it's not his job. It is not his job. Whose job was it? The priest. Was Uzziah a priest? <laughs> no. Let's continue. They confronted King Uzziah and they said, It is not right for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord. That is for the priests and the descendants of Aaron who have been consecrated to burn incense. Leave the sanctuary, for you have been unfaithful. You will not be honored by the Lord God. And Uzziah, who had a censer in his hand, ready to burn incense. He was actually, folks, right in the middle of that act of worship. Or the action of worship. He became angry. And while he was raging at the priests in their presence before the incense altar in the Lord's temple, leprosy broke out on his forehead. When Azariah, the chief priest, and all the other priests looked at him, they saw that he had leprosy on his forehead. So they hurried him out. And indeed, he himself was eager to leave because the Lord had afflicted him. King Uzziah had leprosy until the day he died. He lived in a separate house, leprous, and excluded from the temple of the Lord. Jotham, his son, had charge of the palace, and he governed the people of the land. How did Isaiah start this vision? He said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Look at the last verse in our passage. The other events of Uzziah's reign from beginning to end are recorded by who? You know a great question to ask. What needs to die in order for me to see the Lord? Who? That's a sermon. What needs to be taken out of the way? See, Isaiah, everything that King Uzziah did, Isaiah wrote it. He was the scribe. He, he recorded everything. That was his job before he got into this whole prophet thing. 
So he is following, he's following uh, Uzziah, recording everything. He is right there with Uzziah all the time. And it wasn't until King Uzziah died that he sees the Lord. It makes me wonder if there are some people that need to be taken out of our way in order for us to really see the Lord. It makes me wonder if there's some things in our lives that really need to be taken out of the way before we really, really come to grips with who Jesus really is. That was free. Look at number four. Like live cult, man, I got to preach that someday. Like, li- just pretend you've never heard it when I do, okay? So I get more ums and amen. Like live cult, number four, like live cults from the altar, it will hurt at some level to experience holiness. Let's rewind. The angel took hot coals from the fire with tongs. And he didn't say, hey, put on some mittens. Get, some, get your Bernie mittens. And uh, <laughs> here you go. Uh, he, the angel took those hot coals and they placed, he placed them on Isaiah's lips. You think that wasn't painful? We never talk about that. But it was at that moment that he did that, he said, now your sin's atoned for. Now you're clean. Becoming holy sometimes will be painful. It, it will hurt. It's difficult. It's not easy. Expelling sin from our lives is not easy. It, it's... it's it's hard, it, it, it's tough to do, it's difficult, and sometimes it, it, it's not natural because it goes against how we're wired. We're wired to be carnal, sinful human beings. And then we purge that from ourselves. But that's exactly the refining process that God wants to take us through. Malachi chapter 3, verses 2 and 3 are for you Italians, Malachi. Who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire on a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. Take a look at Titus chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit. Uh, Continuing, uh, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. Uh, You see Job chapter 23, verse 10. Job said this after he had gone through, or while actually he was going through all the trials and the difficulties that he was going through, and, and Job said this, he knows the way that I take. And when he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. So Job saw the difficulties that he endured as a refining fire that, again, when we say a refining fire, it's a fire that purifies where the sediments and the things that don't belong in the gold rise to the top. It's called dross. And that is scooped out by uh, whoever's overseeing that until that gold is totally pure. And it's the heat and it's the refiner's fire that causes the dross to be released from the gold to make it more pure. Peter said this in chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, In all this you greatly rejoice now, for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. They've come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So a question to ask ourselves would be at the middle of page two. 
When and in what way are you most aware of God's refining fire? When do you find him making you more pure? And I bet you enjoy that. <laughs> Stan? Yeah. That's, that's the ultimate test. Some of you in here, you've been through some stuff lately. And God's purpose in allowing that. I'm not saying that God's the source of it. But God's purpose in allowing that is to allow you to be refined. And when you've persevered and you've gone through those fiery, hot times, that you may come out of that more pure, stronger than you've been before. Now, in John chapter 17, we're going to move on to uh, what really should be called the Lord's Prayer. Don't get mad at me, okay? But if you want a passage of Scripture where Jesus, I mean, just prayed, this was the moment right before his crucifixion as he's praying in the garden. This is the moment that Jesus prays before he is arrested. Uh, great sweat drops of blood are, are pouring down from his forehead. So there's a lot of intensity and, and some would even say anguish going on as Jesus is praying. And I think it's interesting to point out what was on Jesus' mind right before he was to die on the cross. What did he pray about? I would venture to guess that if it was important enough for Jesus to pray about right before the worst moment of his life, then it's pretty significant for us to embrace as well. And the first paragraph says, the most effective way to honor God's name is, as holy is by being holy. Uh, this John 17 prayer, and again, the real Lord's prayer, don't get mad, is what Jesus prayed for us in this study we're going to look at a few key verses, but, and I encourage you, read John 17. Read what he prayed for. Read what was on his mind and how he prayed. Uh, it, it's, it's incredible. The next paragraph says, everything that Jesus came to do is compressed into a few words. Uh, we're going to read John 17, verses 3 through 5 in a little bit. In those few simple verses, we see all of eternity in the planning accomplished in 33 years so that we can live forever. Take a look at this verse. It says this, now this is eternal. This is Jesus praying to his Father. And he says, now this is eternal life, that they know you, the true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So letter A asks, what is eternal life? According to Jesus, and I'd say that's a pretty good source, according to Jesus, verse 3, this is eternal life, that they would know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work that you came, I'm sorry, that you gave me to do. Letter B, ask this question, why did Jesus come? Jesus came to do the Father's work. There was nothing about Jesus that he did to try to bring glory to himself. Everything that Jesus did brought glory to his Father. Jesus easily could have been made king by human hands. In fact, Jesus often had to escape away because crowds wanted to violently make him the king of the Jews and overthrow Rome. But that's not why Jesus came. That's not why Jesus came. Jesus came to do the Father's work and to give glory to the Lord. Look at verse 5. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Where is he now? He is in the presence of his Father. He is, the Bible says, at the right hand of the Father, and he is interceding for you and me today. That's where he is now. Number three says this, Jesus prayed for us to be holy. And we're going to look at the same chapter, verses 17 through 19. And holiness is not an optional, you know, it's not like a feature, like, like uh, you know, uh, heated seats in your car, okay? Uh, 
it, it's not a feature, it's not an option. Uh, it, this is an expectation that Jesus has for us. And if Jesus died to make us holy, okay, I'll say it again, if Jesus died to make us holy, then that's what we should strive to be, isn't it? Uh, so letter A, well, first let's read the verse. He says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into this world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. Um, holiness. <laughs> Letter A asks, what does holiness look like to you? Uh, dare say that just on this street, there may be different definitions of that. Uh, some would say that holiness looks like uh, a certain hairstyle and, and, and a certain uh, code of dress. Uh, others would say, well, as long as you don't do this and don't do that and don't do that, you're holy. Problem is, we don't know what to do. <laughs> we just know what not to do. And I think it's a good question for us to ask, how do we associate holiness? Or with what do we associate holiness with? Is it being rigid and never smiling, and not enjoying life. You know, someone left our church years ago because I, I make people laugh too much. And I thought, mm, wow, I, you know, I, I think your view of God might be, and sure, I can get carried away because uh, I love the attention. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I don't think that the picture of Jesus, a holy God, is one that is so rigid that he doesn't always have these moments of of joy he scripture says he dances over us with singing i mean a lot of people don't <laughs> we don't picture that with jesus uh, so holiness very much looks like our god but it's not a man-made holiness it's not based on how you dress or how you look yes you can certainly have your convictions but our convictions should never uh, be a substitute for what God's Word says. And if it's not in there, then let's, let's lighten up a little bit. Okay? You can have your convictions, but please don't make it a heaven-hell issue for me. Does that make sense? Let's go to the last page. And then i got to wrap this up. Page 3, Psalm 9, verse 10 says that those who know your name trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. That's a great verse, by the way. Uh, the Lord has never forsaken those who seek you. We heard some people rattle off uh, some names of, of Jesus earlier, and, and here we've got some examples. Uh, there were moments in Scripture when especially some of our Old Testament heroes would have a moment with God, or, or he would have an experience with God. And uh, he was told that God is Jehovah, for example, Jehovah Shalom, which means God is our peace. Jehovah Rapha, which means God is our healer. Jehovah Jireh means God is our provider. And, and we, we get all these insights into the character and to the awesomeness of God, uh, Number one, we see the, the word or the name Yahweh. Again, another word for Jehovah. I am. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. I'm, I'm going to just do the scriptures here. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. He is creator God. Remember what we said uh, a week or two ago? God is beyond the constraints of time. He is beyond the constraints of any limit that we can even come up with. Uh, Exodus chapter 3, verse 14 says, God said to Moses, I am who I am, and this is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am sent me to you. Number two, we have the, the word Elohim, which literally means creator. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's the very first verse in the, in the Bible right next to 
who presented that Bible to you and on what day? <laughs> the younger crowd has no idea what that meant, but that's very good. Genesis 17.1, uh, we get the name El Shaddai, which means God Almighty. It says, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Number four, Adonai. My Lord, Genesis 15, verse 2. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus? And then 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 18. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord and he said, Who am I, Sovereign Lord? And what is my family that you have brought me this far? He is Lord. God takes a loving responsibility of our care. Let's remind ourselves of this. He is Adonai. He takes loving care of us. He has a loving responsibility over us that he does not take uh, out of obligation, but he takes it uh, because he loves us, out of compassion for us. We already said number five, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord is our provider. Genesis twenty two fourteen. So Abram Call that place the Lord will provide, literally in the Hebrew, Jehovah Jireh. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Uh, what we got? Number six, Jehovah, 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 Jehovah Saba, the Lord, a warrior. First Samuel 17, verse 45, David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin. But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This is the name that David invoked when he was fighting Goliath. God is a fighting God. He fights on our behalf. And then finally, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord is our healer. Exodus chapter, uh, Exodus 15, starting verse 25. Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became, uh, became fit to drink. And there the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them to the test. And he said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases that I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. I am, literally, Jehovah Rafa, aren't you glad that he's a God who heals? Amen. So, what's in a name? Well, in the name Jesus, it's holy, it's powerful. And uh, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. And the righteous can run to that and find safety. And so I want to pray for you as we close that God would make his name very real to you. Uh, I've been called many names over my life, good ones <laughs> and a lot of bad ones. Uh, the good ones have been everything from dad, husband, coach, pastor, preacher, uh, captain, <laughs> uh, hottie. No, I'm kidding. Uh, not hottie. Uh, but all those names were associated by a role that I was fulfilling. Uh, these names of God, they're associated with a role that he wants to fulfill in your life. So there might be moments where you just need Jehovah Rapha to show up in your life because you need him to heal you. There might be times where you, you need Jehovah Jireh to provide for you. You might need Jehovah Shalom to give you that peace of God that surpasses all understanding. All these names of God are all about the role that God plays in your life. However God needs to make himself known to you, I want to pray for you as we close. So can we pray? Lord, your name truly is above all other names. It is mighty, it is powerful, it's incredible. It's at this name, Lord God, that every single knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord. 
And so, Jesus, I pray that you would demonstrate to us who you really are in whatever way that we need you, God. Meet us. May we encounter you in such a way that you not only cleanse us, but you empower us, you provide for us, you do miracles for us. But God, may we know it was because we were in the presence of a holy God. So Lord, I pray that you would take us from here and God, do a work in every life that's listening to this now. And Lord, we'll thank you for all you do. We'll give you praise and glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us today. Appreciate you being here. Online crowd, we love you. Thank you so much for being here as well. God bless you. We'll see you again, Lord willing, on Sunday morning.